Okay, uh, thanks Rob, thanks Lorna and everybody for organising this session. I'm going to be a bit more parochial but over the next 20 minutes, but um, I'm going to pick out four or five themes that we've been pushing with in Greater Manchester for the last 20, 25 years as a way of advocating for archaeology. There's good and there's bad stuff in this, and I'm going to be as honest as I can be with, with the camera running. I was warned about the camera, so with the camera running, I'll be as honest as I can be and polite as I can be. There are some really interesting case studies here on a local level about how to build or constantly rebuild and rework support for archaeology. So as I said, I'm going to uh, bring out three or four um, case studies and hopefully, uh, if I can get the technology to work, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Try the, um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably on the wrong one. Spacebar. Spacebar. Try that. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, Mike. Let's have a look. No, no. Let's see what we can do. <laughs> right, that is working. If nothing else. Oh, that is. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. So, apologies to Rescue for nicking their logo. Um, I grew up in the 1970s, and uh, Rescue and the CBA were very much champions for saving archaeology. I want to be absolutely clear at the start here. My assumption is that all archaeology is political. I think we've heard that throughout the, uh, the day. It's political at some level. Now, uh, that's political quite often with a small p. That is, if you think archaeology is about your local community or the wider community, it's about what happened in the past and how that is relevant for today and how it might change tomorrow. That's all political. That's entirely political. Um, how you then want to take that forward is something else. But to say archaeology is not political is putting your head in the sand because the very act of doing archaeology is, 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 is one of those disciplines where you cannot help but engage with society. And um, I can't think of being more political than that. So, as I said, three or four uh, themes to this. Uh, Greater Manchester is um, you know, the 19th century powerhouse up there in the north. Um, but in the late 20th century, it was a fairly depressed area which was suffering from deindustrialisation. And regeneration in the Greater Manchester area um, was used, or, or rather, was seen as an <coughs> opportunity to bring in heritage as a way of improving uh, the local environment. That inevitably means links with local and national uh, politicians. And one of the things about linking with local and national politicians is that they change, particularly at a national level. Um, I'm not sure what the current figures are for the length of service for ministers uh, in the government, but um, it's, I think, a few years ago they were averaging about 12 months might be slightly longer over the last five years, but even so, that's not a very long time to make a relationship with a Minister of State and trying to get some movement, as indeed the failed Heritage Act in the UK in the late 2000s demonstrates. Just wasn't enough time to, to build an appropriate base and get that through. Quite often, over the last 20, 25 years in Greater Manchester, we focused on local elected members. Why would we do that focusing on councillors? Because councillors tend to be there for a long time. They tend to have local issues at the heart of what they're dealing with. And if you can come across a councillor who is very interested in their local area, but has a wider context in terms of history and archaeology, you have somebody you can talk to and if you like, train and brief and provide information for, who's then going to be a sounding board for some of your worries, whether that be uh, local building being knocked down, local planning application in the green belt, or indeed, at a higher level, changes to, to planning regulations. We've been fortunate enough in Greater Manchester to have <coughs> three or four local councillors over the last 25 years <coughs> who've had a real impact on archaeology because they've been enthusiastic and they've been in positions of power where they can influence support for archaeology. 
whether that be supporting archaeological research, supporting community archaeology, um, or indeed helping with, um, with, with just getting the word about archaeology out to a wider audience. We've also had many local MPs who've been members of uh, Parliament, who've been cult, uh, members of, sort of running the Culture, Media and Sport Department. Um, and, and frankly, the turnover is such that that's almost meaningless. There is no leverage there at all. So working with politicians, <coughs> our experience, my experience in Greater Manchester is it, it, it's better to work with local politicians on local issues. Higher strategy with the with the MPs is uh, is something that is that has to be redone and relearnt um, all the time. Some of the bonuses of that are that you you can have projects running for many many years. Thameside Archaeological Survey here, so you can see ran for 21 years with local authority support. There are other examples in Greater Manchester as well. These, of course, are the exception. But they demonstrate what, what is possible if you have that political backing. Second theme I want to highlight, changing role of museums as a hub for volunteers. Um, in my neck of the woods, uh, volunteers working in museums is something that's grown over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, that's a trend I think you can see across uh, the UK. Museums have their own agenda, which is perfectly understandable because they're creating, creating and curating objects in a particular way, but the overlap with archaeology and local communities is quite extensive. Uh, Manchester Museum, for instance, has a very thri thriving young archaeological uh, club, young archaeologist club, and um, are very supportive in, um, in, in helping that group uh, develop and indeed they use it as one of their uh, big publicity uh, pieces on, on set open days and events. Plenty of other museums have opened in Greater Manchester over the last few decades, many of which are no longer with us. Um, and indeed many museums have been running because of the cuts on a volunteer base and even the volunteer base itself is now disappearing. Bury <coughs> Archives, which is the uh, top right hand corner there on that slide, Bury Archives had a very significant uh, volunteer base, but once they got rid of all their archivists, they got rid of all the uh, volunteers as well. So there's nothing being done in terms of cataloging their, um, their archives at all. And just because you have a popular museum does not guarantee that museum's future. There are plenty of exa examples across the country, and we've had some discussion this morning, I know, about museum closures. Uh, one example locally in Greater Manchester something called Satanti, which was actually based on archaeological work in Thameside over 20 years, second most popular visited visitor attraction in a museum in Thameside, uh, closed. Closed because it didn't fit with the council's um, agenda as to how they were going to implement cuts across the museum service. So, museums change and evolve just as archaeology changes and evolve. The third theme I want to just bring out very briefly is the value or perceived lack of value of archaeology amongst a variety of stakeholders. And I've lumped quite an uh, interesting array of people here. HLF, Historic England, Universities, Developers. Quite often we separate those into, sep into different categories. But these are all groups who don't necessarily have archaeology as their primary focus. HLF has a separate archaeology strand. Um, Historic England, of course, employs archaeologists and provides archaeological planning advice. Universities, well, I think it's about 33 universities in the UK have archaeology departments teaching single honours archaeology. And as for developers, well, they underpin most of the profession, most of the 5,500 full-time jobs in the UK. They all have different agendas. Now we've we've heard quite a bit today about some of the some of the issues of dealing with uh, a number of these groups, particularly uh, developers. Agendas change every time an agenda change. We have to remake the case for archaeology. That could be changing planning guidance affecting developers. 
It could be changing personnel. It could be the threat of the renewal of the licence of uh, the lottery fund and HLF in a few years' time. It could be universities reorganising their perspectives and their uh, funding in the light of um, current financial uh, pressures. Um, I know that personally, having uh, left, what, what was the phrase Ben used earlier on? Um, having parted company with the University of Manchester in 2009. Uh, one of the consequences of which was archaeology was spread across two other universities, MMU and Salford University, since then. Uh, fourth and final point before I wrap up. Encouraging local societies and groups. CBA has done an awful lot of research on this, as has plenty of other people. What we do know is that local groups have increased a lot in numbers since the mid 1980s. We have the statistics uh, for that. And in Greater Manchester, uh, we can demonstrate that in two ways. This is the spread of local archaeology societies in the early 1980s. Um, the one in red, incidentally, is defunct. The, and this is the spread of archaeology societies since 2008. <laughs> Now this, in effect, we've got 17 archaeological societies today. We had in the mid-1980s about six or seven. Today we have about 1,500 members of those groups. They are activists for archaeology, potentially. They are your campaign group. They are our campaign, campaign group. They helped found the first professional archaeology unit in Greater Manchester in 1980. And in 2008-9, um, they lobbied on behalf of uh, every, you know, uh, the archaeology community in Greater Manchester to stop the closure of the University of Manchester Archaeology Unit unsuccessfully, but because that pressure group was there, the, um, the Archaeological Planning Service was moved to another venue rather than closed down uh, a couple of years later, and archaeology ended up at two other universities. So that is a powerful base to uh, be involved with. And finally, role of professionals and academic archaeologists in engaging the public. It works both ways. Professionals need to engage with the voluntary sector. The voluntary sector needs to engage with the public. There are some classic ways of doing that. Long-running projects are one in Manchester, Dig Moston, Dig Greater Manchester, Whitworth Park, Community Archaeology Project, Mellor. All of these are set-piece, long-running projects. But it generates local interest, and that's where I think part of this desire to create a, a local society is coming from. But there are new forms of groups coming and going, courtesy of social media, campaigning groups. We have a, an online group, Dig, Discover and Joy, who are entirely around, based around, well not entirely based, but uh, are, are social media based, but also practically based. They, they do a lot of their communication via social media. And the CBA has a very strong role to play here as, as people who are looked up to as a group who provide the voluntary sector, the whole of the profession, with advice and training. Um, I'll just skip over that to get to the conclusion then. <clears throat> so, all right, worked in Greater Manchester for 28 years. What can I conclude? It's quite simple, and I think this is a theme that's come up a, an awful lot today. We can't rely on other sectors to assume that archaeology is a really good thing. We have to constantly retrain ourselves and tell the message, whatever that message is, again and again and again. I was very struck by the Irish example just before lunch, where you have a local community who are hostile to the archaeology and who don't want to engage with the archaeology because they see it as a threat. And there, there have been instances in the past, in my neck of the woods, where you can see that. Education is one way uh, around that. So if we want to keep archaeology for the future, then I think those of us who work in archaeology and those of us who enjoy archaeology in the voluntary sector, we need to work together and we need to take those successes in the past but also the failures and build on those and remember them. This is about collective memory. The problems and the successes go hand in hand. It's no use just talking about, oh isn't this project wonderful, and look at all the wonderful goodies we've got and how many school kids we've got down here. We've got to think about the 
real problems that are highlighted in archaeology in our own areas and we have to do the two things and I can't stress enough we have to keep reinventing and relearning and reteaching about archaeology to our politicians to the local community um, to schools to universities to all those stakeholders it can't just be done once I'm afraid it's a never-ending cycle thank you <laughs>